I have a friend who is one of those guys who intentionally lives his life carefree and unfettered. At age 35, he is not married, has no children. Though he is very well educated, he doesn't go in for that boring old traditional rat race that the rest of us run day in and day out. Instead, he works enough to take care of what he needs and spends the rest of his time surfing or hunting or gardening or traveling. It's a way of life that allows for a lot of flexibility, and spontaneity. To be able to live the way he does, my friend is always looking for unusual work and unusual living opportunities that might allow him the freedom he values so much. Recently, a family friend inherited a long neglected house from a distant relative and had to find a quick solution to get the house up to code before the city condemned the building. The first call he made was to my friend who now lives in that dilapidated house for free in exchange for fixing it up. Sounds like a great deal for my friend, but let me tell you, you and I do not ever want to live in this house. You can see the ground through the floorboards. The house is inhabited by myriad creatures and not just little ones. And because of its age and disrepair, it has certain quirks. Like leaking plumbing requiring one to run downstairs, turn on the water before running back upstairs to flush the toilet, then running back downstairs to quick turn off the water again. As I mentioned, most of us might not share my friend's enthusiasm about his good fortune in finding such a living situation. But my friend is young and unencumbered. He doesn't have a family to worry about or large expenses to handle. He has hours and hours of free time on his hands. This situation might not work for the average person, but for him, it's just fine. That day that Jesus got up to preach and said something like we just heard Lisa read from our gospel lesson, he was certainly received with puzzled expressions from listeners thinking about responsibilities and expenses and budgets and feeding hungry children. These famous teachings of Jesus are so jarring that even a casual cultural Christian will find at least some paraphrase of this familiar. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Don't worry about what you will eat or drink. Don't store up treasures on earth. And they're so familiar to us that we either repeat the words piously with no real intention of ever taking them seriously, or we just dismiss them altogether as the wishful thinking of a man who, like my friend, did not have a family to feed or very many obligations to the community hanging over his head or any real material need to speak of at all. There Jesus was. The golden boy of Nazareth, traveling the countryside with his trusty group of disciples, sleeping wherever they could, depending on the kindness of friends and strangers, viewing each day as a new adventure in finding what they needed to survive. It was a little exciting not to worry about where your next meal was coming from, if you were Jesus. Of course he could sit up on the top of the rise and say things like, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. What did Jesus know about financial obligations, about hungry mouths to feed, about the volatile economy that could just pull the rug right out from under you with no notice whatsoever? Good for Jesus that he could be so footloose, but there's no way that his words have any modern day relevance for the rest of us. It's true. There are a lot of hard, challenging words assembled in these few chapters in the middle of Matthew, part of the gospels we often call the Sermon on the Mount. And perhaps the ones we heard today are the hardest of all. Many scholars would say that these verses are the very heart of Jesus' teaching on material wealth, how and why and how much we acquire in terms of possessions and money. Jesus talks a lot about that sort of thing 
in the New Testament, but it's right here in these verses that he doesn't pull any punches. In Matthew's account, these verses come right in the second half of the Sermon on the Mount, like right after the halfway point. So let's remember what comes before them, the Beatitudes, the reminder to be salt and light in the world, teachings on divorce and adultery, instruction to love your enemy, warnings against showing off your piety in front of everyone. Then at the beginning of this section, Jesus lays it out straight. Don't store up treasures on earth. Don't even think you can serve two masters, God and money, because you can't. And then right there, right in the very middle of our passage today, Jesus uses just one little word that has a great deal of meaning. It's almost like the hidden key to unlock this passage. It's right there at the beginning of verse 25. It's the word therefore. And therefore means something like, in light of everything you have just heard, or because of all of this, or something like that. It's like Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, I am unfolding the wonder and potential of a brand new order of life, the kingdom of God. It's coming to be all around you. Embrace it, give your life to it, open your heart to take it on as your mission and vision, live it to change the world. And therefore, If you decide that this is the way of life for you, well then, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. See what Jesus is doing here? He's not really talking about our material possessions or what we wear or if we're thirsty. In fact, he's saying that those are not even the questions we should be asking. Instead, if we say that we are followers of Jesus, if we choose to live the gospel, the kingdom of God way, the question suddenly becomes totally different. The question is not anymore, what do you have? The question is, who do you love? Questions about possessions are inconsequential. The real urgent question that Jesus wants us to answer is, where is your heart? Wait a minute, could we be hearing right? Jesus, let's review, a single unencumbered man who was not bound by responsibilities. How could he know how much we worry? If he did, he wouldn't say such strange things. People listening on the hill that day in Galilee scratched their heads too, and we find these words so baffling. After all, we're Americans. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We live in the society of the little guy making good if he works hard enough. We've been taught from early on that material security is critical. And if we work hard enough, we can make it happen by force of will. And we also believe that we don't often say out loud that material comfort is a sign of good character. It's the American way, but it's not God's way. This passage gives us a glimpse of the sharp contrast between the way God views the world and the way that we tend to view the world. Well, well, God acts with lavish goodness to all of creation. You and I, we tend to live our lives only seeing limits. I bet it doesn't surprise you that I point out today that we don't tend to think the same way God does. The economy of God is characterized by abundance and this theology of abundance is too scary for us. Rather, you and I, we like to spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. You and I are continuously grasping. We must try to have what we need and not just what we need, what we want. We deserve it. And if we don't grab it, somebody else will. 
the abundant model of unclenching our fists and spreading the blessing of God around was so threatening for the folks sitting on the hill listening to Jesus. They, like us, could not imagine a world in which security could be found anywhere other than grasping desperately to keep what they had and to get more. But that's not God's way. That's a theology of scarcity. And in a theology of scarcity, our fists are closed, grasping at anything we can. And it's when we live with a theology of scarcity that distinctions start to arise among us, don't they? Like classism, differentiation between the haves and the have-nots, the abuse of power for personal gain. That's why Jesus is here changing the question altogether, pulling his listeners away from worrying about material possessions and instead pushing all of us toward a place where we can ask ourselves, where do we put our highest allegiance? And that's because the question of who we love has nothing to do with an inventory of what we have. In fact, the two probably stand at odds. The kind of love that Jesus was talking about here is a love that goes all out with abandon, true and deep love, commitment, and it requires a seeding of control, just opening up our hands and giving up the illusion that we can predict or control or manufacture our lives. This kind of love demands utter trust and full surrender, and it's risky, it's so so risky. This kind of love invites us to open our hearts and ask ourselves, how are our priorities ordered? To whom do we offer our deepest devotion and highest commitment? What Jesus was talking about when he was going on about lilies and birds was not actually a single man's carefree approach to vaguely irresponsible living. No, what Jesus meant was that when we change the question to ask instead who we love, we will find ourselves increasingly freed from fear and greed and all of those qualities that fuel and preoccupy our materialistic angst. Because the kind of love Jesus is talking about is one that turns it all over, gives it all away, not just materially, but at the very core of who we are, everything utterly surrendered to God. Perhaps you'd agree with me that the news we're seeing lately is rather ironic, given the fact that we are just on the edge of the season of Thanksgiving. You've been watching, as I have, the declarations of American leaders all over our country this week. We don't want Syrian refugees here. They will take away our things. They will risk the safety of our communities because they are terrorists. Keep them away. I'd like to say this morning in the name of the one who asked us to consider who we love to the 31 governors of U.S. states that have declared Syrian refugees unwelcome and the 289 members of the United States House of Representatives who voted Thursday to approve a bill effectively blocking Syrian refugees from finding safety in our country. Shame on you. The rhetoric that these and other leaders are engaging in is fear-mongering of the highest order, despicable in a way that's hard to put into words. But this week I read this reflection. Listen to what Laurel Saxena had to say. There is no reason, not one single reason why I deserve shelter, food, stability, safety, health, or your regard any more than any given Syrian refugee. Not one reason. 
my home, my education, my business, the way I look, the way I talk, the fact that I come home to a safe, whole, healthy family every day, every one of those things is a privilege that I fell into by the random circumstance of being born in this country to parents who value academic achievement. I or you could just have easily been born in Syria or Burkina Faso or Afghanistan. Do you really think that you are a different kind of human being than the refugees? Do you really think that your privilege is earned? I know, you've worked hard for what you have. I have too. But have we worked harder than the refugees who worked for lives that were utterly destroyed? Do we love our children more than they do? Would we grieve harder if a civil war took them away from us? And how long do you think it would take for a bomb to destroy everything safe about your life? Compared to most people in the world, you and I are rich with privilege. Most of, most of it because we were lucky enough to be born in a country fat with it. She writes, I woke up early this morning and made organic whole grain muffins for my son. Then I dressed him in warm clothes and put sunscreen on his little face. I strapped him and buckled him into his bike seat and rode along peaceful streets to deliver him to his warm, nurturing preschool. There were so many levels on which I was able to protect him. Every breath of this morning was a privilege. Meanwhile, millions of children who months ago had bedrooms and dinner tables and doctors and schools are sleeping directly on the ground because their parents are unable to secure shelter and food for them, much less healthcare or education. And no, that is not your fault. But that's not the same as it not being our responsibility. We have everything we need and so much more on top of that. And we can choose to exemplify to our own children one of two courses of action. We can open our clenched fist and share with our hu fellow human beings all of the abundance that exists here, or we can hoard it, greedy and bloated and fearful. Because there's no such thing as our own. Every human is our own. Every hungry child, grieving mother, frightened husband, weary grandmother is our own. Nobody gets to pretend that our world is a different world than the world that creates civil wars and bombs and hunger. We are all towing the same precarious, shifting tightrope of life and anyone can fall at any time. All there is to catch us is each other. Who do you love? That's the question, not what do you have, who do you love? Well, you and I and the people on the mountain that day with Jesus often don't have the first clue how to begin changing the questions of our lives. We do know what that kind of love looks like. In fact, we've experienced a love like this. It's God's love, the kind of love that would sacrifice everything, that would go to the ends of the earth for me, for you. And because God has loved us with abandon, we don't have to worry. In fact, because God loves us like this, we have the utter freedom to completely change the question, to refuse to live our lives shackled to things, to live instead with freedom and joy and the same kind of love that God has lavished on us. Friends, never mind what's for lunch and don't worry about what you wore to church today. Open your arms and unclench your fists and ask the most important question of all, who do you love? The way you live will be your answer. Amen.
Amen. Amen.